Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's Healing Perspectives Lecture brought to you by the Institute for Health and Healing. My name is Dr. Akhil Palanisamy and I'll be your host for today's evening. I'm a physician at Sutter's Institute for Health and Healing in Sacramento. So a recording of the presentation will be available for replay on our YouTube channel after this event. The link is included in the chat below and we'll also email you the link within the next week. So before we get started, I want to go over some quick housekeeping to prepare you for today. Please note today's lecture is for informational purposes only. Everyone's situation is unique and we ask that you seek out professional advice for your specific medical needs. Next, we'll quickly review how to use these functions in Zoom to ask questions and get technical support from our team if needed. So this will be an interactive lecture. You will not be on camera, but we do encourage you to participate today. So polls will appear on the screen periodically for you to respond anonymously. The chat is currently disabled and will be turned on when our speakers ask questions for you to respond to. See the chat icon on the bottom bar of your screen. And if you have questions for the speaker or for our team, click the Q&A icon to type your questions. We have a team monitoring your questions and we'll try to respond to as many of them as time allows at the end of tonight's presentation. Please note your responses are only visible to our team for HIPAA compliance. Next, to change the view of the slide and presenter, adjust the slider between the two screens or select the view option in the top right corner. If you're having a hard time hearing or seeing anything during the talk, please refresh your screen and double check your internet settings or connection. But if you need additional help, use the Q&A icon and our team will help you troubleshoot. Remember, you can access a recording of this talk directly after the event using the YouTube link in the chat. Many people learn best by watching and listening to our talks first and then returning to the recording to take notes. So to thank you for being here today, we'll also send you a post-event email with a list of resources and this slide deck that you can download. And finally, at the end of today's talk, please share your feedback by taking our short survey, which will pop up automatically. So now that we've covered the housekeeping items, I wanna share more about the Institute for Health and Healing. We offer integrative medicine clinical care that combines the best of conventional medicine with proven healing practices from around the world that serve the whole person. We have integrative medical clinics in San Francisco, San Carlos, Santa Rosa, Roseville, and Sacramento that offer the services listed here. Many of our services are covered by insurance. The Institute for Health and Healing hosts free healing perspectives events, like today's event, multiple times a year with top medical practitioners. Now let me introduce today's event sponsor, Dr. Nita Jain. Nita is the founder and medical director of the Palo Alto Medical Foundation's Integrative Medicine Department, where she also serves as an internal medicine physician. So over to you, Dr. Jane. Thank you, Dr. Palanasamy. Hello and welcome. I'm excited to be here today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Janet Volpe. But first, let me share a little about our integrated medicine department at Palo Alto Medical Foundation. We are also referenced as a San Carlos site for the Institute for Health and Healing, as Dr. Palanasamy said earlier. Um, our talented team of providers sees a wide variety of patients, and we are very proud to say most of our services are covered by insurance. We know that matters. Our team includes integrated medicine physicians who have previously spent decades practicing in internal medicine, pediatrics, or family medicine. They are trained and skilled in integrated medicine and functional medicine. We also have a physician assistant naturopath and an acupuncturist. It is an accomplished team and I'm very proud of the care we provide. We support existing traditional treatment regimens, uphold the highest standards of safety and efficacy, and recommend treatments that are either evidence-based or evidence-informed. We offer individual consults, acupuncture, and online shared medical appointments where you can receive face-to-face -face care with our clinicians covering a wide variety of topics, as you see listed. Yeah, there they are right there. Um, Palo Alto Medical Foundation's Integrated Medicine Department and many of our new programs would not be possible without support from Palo Alto Medical Foundation, Palo Alto Foundation Medical Group leadership and help from our generous donors. We thank you very much for being here today, and our hope is that this free health education leaves you feeling empowered. 
Now, it is my privilege to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Janet Volpe. Dr. Volpe is an experienced pediatrician practicing integrative pediatrics for the past eight years. She is board certified in pediatrics, integrative medicine, and has extensive training with the Institute for Functional Medicine and the Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Her passion for contemporary research on the microbiome, ancestral health, polyvagal theory, and regenerative agriculture has informed her care philosophy, ultimately enhancing her patient's health and vitality regardless of age. We are very fortunate to have her here today to give us insights on how guided imagery can unlock your child's potential. Now it is my honor to welcome Dr. Volpe. Thank you, Nita. Thank you, Akil. Thank you everyone for being here. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity to share how and why guided imagery has become such a valuable tool for the children and teens I serve in my integrative practice. I began my career as a general pediatrician, then almost 10 years ago, I shifted my practice to integrative pediatrics. I did this as a response to the rising number of children and teens I was seeing with chronic medical conditions. I wanted more tools to not only manage symptoms, but also to get to the root cause of what was out of balance, of what was preventing kids from living their best lives. And what fueled my passion to begin studying this branch of medicine was a personal health journey I had experienced as my chronic conditions, migraines and fatigues began to decrease after working with my integrative practitioner to address the root causes of my underlying inflammation. And though the rabbit hole of doing lots of expensive, fancy specialty testing and taking an abundance of costly supplements exists, what I learned from the work I've been doing with kids for almost a decade now is that we can often get pretty far by working on the foundational pillars of health, getting them into balance. And this includes adequate nutrition, sleep, spending time outdoors, moving the body, and centering the mind. And while there are all sorts of strategies to help kids eat a more wholesome diet, to work towards better sleep hygiene, to get them outside, what I witnessed was the mindfulness piece was the trickiest for kids to work on. So often this part would get skipped. And this is critical because without centering the mind, which means getting our fight, flight, freeze nervous system into balance with our rest and digest branch of our nervous system, our ability to reduce symptoms is greatly diminished. And because I experienced a lot of resistance from kids, whenever I would bring up meditation, breathing exercises, yoga, this led to my unexpected discovery of guided imagery. And this has opened a whole new world of possibilities for the patients that I serve. One of these patients is Jared. So Jared's been a patient of mine for the last five years. I first met him when he was nine years old. He had been diagnosed with anxiety and ADHD. He was on short acting stimulant medication, which improved his behavioral issues at school, but his parents weren't medicating him at home because it reduced his appetite and they were concerned about his weight. One of his major issues at home is that he was routinely fighting with his younger brother. This had been going on for years. Jared's a typical example of the type of kid who ends up in my practice. I see a lot of kids now with ADHD and anxiety. By the time they get to me, they've usually already worked with their primary care provider for a while. They may have a psychologist, a psychiatrist, maybe a developmental pediatrician. They may be working with their school and have a 504 plan, possibly an IEP, and may even have tried medita medication. There's a lot of variability to responses from these interventions, as you can probably imagine. Most parents come to me wondering, well, is there anything else that we can try? We have a poll question now to help us all understand how many of you may be experiencing similar issues with kids in your life. And so the, oh gosh, yay, it's getting filled. Wow, oh my gosh, fantastic. I'm gonna keep letting it go for a few more moments. And then, um, I love this variety. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's, it's like almost like one third, one third, one third. I think we can, we can close out the poll. Okay. All right, so 10 years ago, when I began my integrative practice, I didn't set out to become a specialist for ADHD or anxiety, but kids with these ailments, 
the poll is back. Okay, maybe that means I need to comment on it. Um, um, we're still at about one third, one third, one third of all the variety of answers. Okay, so kids with anxiety and ADHD ended up filling up my appointment slots and I think this is a big reason why. Our children and teens are truly suffering at alarming rates. In 2019, six million kids in this country were diagnosed with ADHD. At the same time, almost six million were diagnosed with anxiety. And the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been absolutely devastating for mental health disorders among our youth. The number of kids experiencing anxiety alone has nearly doubled from pre-COVID statistics. Think about that. Additional stressors may be contributing to this staggering statistic as is shown here on this slide. One of the major draws of using guided imagery as a tool for mood and behavioral issues is that it empowers kids to understand they carry something within themselves to promote balance. Some of you may have experience using imagery but if you're among those who think you've never done a type of imagery exercise, I'd like to present the case that if you've ever worried about something that could go wrong in your future or replayed an event from the past that didn't go as well as you thought it would, you have engaged in imagery. Negative self, negative self storytelling about our past experiences or future events has been scientifically demonstrated to strengthen groups of nerve cells in our brain to remain wired in negativity. This increases our risk of brain and body inflammation. Guided imagery can shift these negative self thoughts into positive ones that rewire the brain for balance, increasing our resiliency to meet life's challenges. By the end of this presentation, my hope is that everyone will have an understanding of what guided imagery is, how it affects our mind-body stress response, and what the scientific evidence has to say about it. So what is guided imagery? Imagery is defined as using our mind to create an image of something right inside our head. Imagery can involve all our senses, not just visual, but also sound, smell, taste, touch. Guided imagery means the person having the imagery experience is being led or guided to imagine positive images by a trained professional. And it turns out that a person experiencing a guided imagery exercise activates the same brain cells that get activated if that person is seeing or hearing or tasting or smelling or touching the real positive thing in the outer world. So early in my research, I came across the book, Guided Imagery Work with Kids by Melissa Dormoy. And this is the sentence from that book that reeled me in. <clears throat> Easier to practice than meditation or hypnosis. Guided imagery allows kids to quickly focus, integrate their thoughts, emotions, feelings, and practice self-compassion all without the need for extraordinary discipline or time investment. Enough now of me talking about imagery. What I would like to do is invite everyone to experience a guided imagery exercise. This exercise is 13 minutes long it's open for anyone to do. I would like to share though, if you're driving a car, if you're operating heavy machinery um, or experiencing a more significant mental health crisis at this time, hold off for now. If you're interested in experiencing this exercise, um, this presentation is being recorded so it will be available for you to experience in the future. Okay, let's all get settled in. Get comfortable. If you're in a chair, have both feet on the floor. Keep your legs uncrossed if that's possible. If you're on the floor or on your bed or reclining on your sofa, 
Have your legs and feet out in front of you, also on cross if possible. Let's all take one deep breath in through the nose. And when ready, release it out your mouth. And either with your eyes closed or opened and softly focused on an object within your gaze. Begin breathing in through the nose and exhaling out the mouth at a pace that feels comfortable for you. As you breathe in through your nose, nourishing air enters your entire being. And as you exhale out your mouth, you can release any thoughts, concerns, and any worries for the moment. Feeling your body begin to become more relaxed right here, right now. As thoughts arise, I invite you to let them go with your next exhale breath. As your mind empties out thoughts, concerns, and any worries, your body has the space to fill with more relaxation. Each cell of your being relaxes as these thoughts are replaced with relaxation. And your entire body may begin to feel more warm and more relaxed. You might imagine as you inhale that you are filling yourself up with clean, fresh air and energy. And as you exhale, you release any tension and discomfort you may have been holding on to. Breathing in energy and breathing out tension. Good, good. Now focus your awareness on your left foot. Just notice any tension which might be present there and invite your left foot to relax and let go of that tension, releasing and relaxing, allowing your left foot to relax more comfortably without any concern for how it's happening. Just notice the sensation of letting go in that left foot, inviting it to reach a deeper and more comfortable state of ease a really enjoyable and pleasant feeling beginning to deepen in that foot. And now notice any tension you might be holding in your right foot and allow your right foot to release and relax more. Noticing the sensation of relaxation beginning to deepen in your right foot. In both feet now, as you allow your feet to head for deeper and more comfortable states of relaxation. Knowing that at any time when you relax any part of your body, the rest of you relaxes more deeply as well. And as you allow the relaxation in your feet to deepen, notice any tension you might be holding in the muscles of your left lower leg, including the large muscles of your calf, just letting it go allowing your entire left lower leg to relax more deeply without any concern for how it's happening. And now notice any tension you might be holding in your right lower leg and allow that to release and relax. Noticing the pleasant sensation of relaxation in both lower legs, spreading down both ankles, connecting with the pleasant sensation of relaxation in both feet and allowing the relaxation to spread up to both your knees. Now notice any tension you might be holding in the muscles of your left upper leg, the large left thigh muscles that do so much work during your day and release and relax the muscles of your left upper leg as you let go more easily and more deeply. Now noticing for any tension you might be holding in your right upper leg, Release and relax the muscles of your right thigh, allowing both upper legs to release more deeply. Notice the sensation of comfort and ease as this occurs, just letting go, almost as if it is happening all by itself. Now bring your attention to your hips and to your lower back. Notice any tension in these areas and release and relax anything that may be held here. 
Release and relax any tension in your mid back. And now in your belly, release and relax any tension that might be being held in your stomach, your intestines, feeling your entire belly relaxing more deeply, more easily, comfortably, releasing and relaxing now any tension in your chest, including all the muscles between your ribs. And now invite your lungs and your heart to relax. Release and now relax your shoulder blades, your upper arms, so they can join in this pleasant and enjoyable sense of letting go. Letting go of any tension in your elbows, in your lower arms and wrists. Continuing to release and relax any tension in both hands, including all the important muscles of your fingers and your thumbs. Now notice any tension you might be holding in your neck. These important muscles responsible for holding your head up all day long. Allow them to take a well-deserved rest. Just inviting your neck to let go easily and naturally. Inviting your neck to join in with that deep, comfortable state of relaxation you feel in other parts of your body. And now relax and release any tension you may feel in your scalp or in your forehead, noticing a luxurious state of relaxation beginning to flow down your face, down your cheeks, your jaw muscles, feeling the release in the ease in your entire face. Feeling this warming sense of ease continue to flow down your neck, back down your shoulders and arms, your torso, your legs, all the way back down to your feet, enjoying this pleasant state of relaxation. Now, imagine you are walking along a beautiful path in nature. It's a warm day and the temperature feels perfect as you welcome the gentle breeze which refreshes your entire being. Sunlight is flickering through the branches of the surrounding trees. Birds are sounding happy as they chirp in these trees from up above. You are alone and feel completely safe and comfortable walking on this path. With each relaxing inhale through your nose, you take in the fragrant scent of wildflowers and tree trunks. Shortly ahead, your path veers to your left, where you now find yourself at the top of a wooden staircase. At the bottom of the staircase is your own peaceful, private, and special place. This is your sanctuary. And as you begin to descend the steps your special place in this natural setting. A feeling of deep peace washes over you. The sense of deep peace and relaxation grows with each step you take. Once you've reached the bottom step, take a few moments to examine your surroundings. What do you notice out in front of you? Is there any plant life in your special place? Are there any bodies of water in your view? What sounds do you hear? What time of day is it? Take some time to explore your special place. You might want to wander a bit. When you are ready, find a spot in your special place and sit down. As you are sitting, you feel a strong connection with the earth beneath you. 
grounding you in this present moment. This allows for any remaining concerns, worries, or thoughts about your future or your past to be released with each exhaled breath. If you like, you can watch these thoughts, worries, and concerns. Leave your exhaled breath and become dissolved by the surrounding beauty of your special place. With each inhale breath, all the cells of your being are nourished by this powerful energy of your surrounding special place. Take a few more moments inhaling the nourishment of this present moment and exhaling what you no longer need. And when you are ready, come up off the ground and bid goodbye for now to your special place, knowing you can return anytime you like. For now, though, walk back up the wooden staircase and out of your special place. Walk back down and out of your path in nature. And when you are ready, open your eyes if they were closed. You may want to wiggle your fingers and toes. You may want to stretch your limbs. Take the time you need and come back to our group when you're ready. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. All right, how are you all feeling? I'd like to invite you to share one word in the chat to describe how things are going for you. Calm, peace, calm, relaxed, amazing, sleepy, tired, peaceful, relaxed, calm, relaxed, refreshed, peaceful, rested, tingly, ooh, happy, lighter, relaxed, calm, thankful, like jelly. Oh my gosh, so much amazing, like, wow, like words that are like coming, flying. Oh my gosh, fantastic. Wow, thank you guys like so much for sharing. I would love to be able to stay here and respond to like all these words, but um, we're moving on. Okay, so what was going on during this exercise? We took time to relax. We got settled. We spent a few minutes relaxing our mind, relaxing our body with deep breathing and progressive muscle relaxation. If you were able to follow along, your imagination was guided to create a sensory experience in your brain, which we know from scientific data, these are the same cells in the brain that get activated when we have the same sensory experience in the outer world. And because sensory experiences have been scientifically shown to rewire our brain to promote restoration and balance, we can tap into the power of our imagination to do so in a relatively short period of time. And then once the exercise is over and we return to the present moment in the outer world, reflection is important because this is how we integrate what we've experienced. This not only strengthens the wiring of our nerve cells in the brain and the body, which came into more balance during that positive experience, but reflection also allows us to process feelings that might have arisen that we may not be used to experience. I mean, how many of us are used to feeling calm, relaxation, sleepy, all those words that came out in the chat? on a 5.30 p.m. in a random Wednesday afternoon, sharing our experience with others, as some of you did in the chat, is one way to reflect. For some people, especially teens and kids who may not be comfortable discussing their feelings, other modes of expression of feelings such as journaling or drawing can allow for even more integration. 
though scientific studies began demonstrating the effectiveness of guided imagery in the 1940s, there's additional data to show. We've got evidence that imagery has been used as a tool for optimizing health for thousands of years all over the globe in various indigenous traditions, in traditional Chinese medicine, and in ancient Greece. A combination of mounting scientific evidence and the mind-body movement of the last 50 years or so began showing the effectiveness of guided imagery for a variety of conditions, in addition to mood and behavioral issues. And this includes chronic abdominal pain, insomnia, migraines, immune system function, and enhancing cancer treatment. So what's going on with the nerve cells connecting our brain to our body and our body to our brain when we're under stress? Nervous system physiology is absolutely fascinating. I love sharing this information with kids. It's important for them to understand how their nervous system works and how a mindfulness practice enhances the health of their brain and their body. The ship analogy is one way to tell this story. Okay, so if you think of our body as a ship, the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, it's like the captain. This is where we make our decisions, where we concentrate, where we focus, have impulse control, feel joy and feel safety. This is the captain. The captain on a ship relies on information about navigation, about conditions on the sea, about the mechanical workings of the ship. And the hippocampus in our brain, it's like the control panel. This feeds information to the captain, the prefrontal cortex from the hippocampus. And then there's the amygdala. The amygdala is like the shipmate stationed way up on the crow's nest. Look out for approaching hazards like rough seas, pirates, maybe killer whales. If the crow's nest mate is overly stressed from lack of sleep, too much junk food, too much screen time, and starts to overly warn the captain of potential danger when the danger does not exist, the captain won't be able to remain organized and be able to make good decisions, concentrate. The captain can get disorganized. Mindfulness has been shown to balance the amygdala so we can captain our path in life most optimally. And it's not that we wanna get rid of our amygdala, it's critical for our survival when we're under threat. This is how we evolved as humans. In prehistoric times, these threats came on fast, like a saber-toothed tiger rushing at us. The amygdala causes a person to release the fight or flight hormone cortisol. This way we could get away fast or fight the offending predator. If a person survived their threat and the immediate threat then was gone, the cortisol levels returned to normal, the amygdala activity reduced back to baseline. But in our modern world, the amygdala remains activated. Our cortisol levels remain high and our brain and body suffer the consequences, including feeling anxious, less able to concentrate, focus, and engage with others socially. The brain and body communicate via very complex nerve cell wirings. This includes the sympathetic nervous system running through our spinal cord, and it's responsible for our fight or flight response, and the parasympathetic nervous system that runs outside the spinal cord in our vagus nerve. This is responsible both for our rest and digest state and the freeze response. Together, our sympathetic nervous system and our parasympathetic nervous system make up our autonomic nervous system. If a person is chronically stuck in fight or flight with an overactive amygdala, they are chronically producing stress hormones, which makes it difficult to activate the pathways in the brain to think, to focus, to concentrate, to have impulse control, to feel joyful. And when the freeze response is dominant, it could make a kid or teen wanna stay in bed all day and not engage with others socially. This activation of the fight, flight, freeze response in a person with anxiety or ADHD can be very apparent to an observer. Multiple studies over many years have demonstrated that engaging in a mindfulness practice, which includes guided imagery, can strengthen the rest and digest portion of the vagus nerve. 
when this branch of highly evolved nerve fibers is activated, it is physiologically impossible to have our fight, flight, or freeze nerve pathways dominate. This is the equivalent of that stressed out, sleep deprived shipmate perched up high on the crow's nest, getting replaced with a new and well-rested balanced shipmate that will be able to work in harmony with the captain and the control panel. And again, there's strong scientific evidence that demonstrates the role for mindfulness in balancing the autonomic nervous system. Specifically, guided imagery has been shown for both adults and kids to regulate heart rate, breathing pattern, blood pressure, skin temperature, and even brain wave activity. And though my focus today is on kids, guided imagery has also been shown to be effective for adults. Though what's really cool about this modality of of mindfulness for kids is that kids in general tend to have more active imaginations than most adults. So they can get to their special place even more easily than most grown-ups can. In the 1990s, the newly developed functional MRI technology was able to explain how guided imagery works. What was discovered is absolutely fascinating. Okay, so the same nerve cells in the brain and body that get activated by real sensory experiences that we have in the outer world also get activated when our imagination creates the sensory experiences. So by imagining positive experiences, the cells of our nervous system behave as if it really happened. This can rewire the brain that's been locked even for a long time in a pattern of worry and dread. And this concept is the basis of neuroplasticity. So how effective is guided imagery and rewiring the brain and body for more balance? It's time for another poll question. I'd like to ask you guys to take your best guess. How many published studies are there on the guided imagery's effectiveness? Okay, and we'll run this for a bit to see the choices. As you guys know, less than 1,000, 1 to 2,000, greater than 2,000. Wow, gosh, oh, I, I, I love this. We're just like the initial poll question. We're about a third, a third, a third. This is fantastic. Okay, we can end the poll and close out this chat and I will let you guys know as of now um, we have just over 3,000 published studies in peer-reviewed journals showing how effective guided imagery is for a variety of health issues for both kids and teens as well as adults. Okay remember my patient Jared the 14 year old with ADHD and anxiety that I've been working with for the last five years, who continue to fight with his younger brother. Last fall, when I began offering guided imagery group medical visits for kids, his mom signed him up. For the first two sessions, he was pretty quiet, kind of fidgety. He didn't share much with the group, and this was okay because sharing is, is never mandatory. Then at the start of a third session, Jared raised his Zoom hand. All my visits are virtual, by the way. When I asked um, if anyone wanted to share how their week was going before we started the session, this is what he said to our group. A few days before the session, he got into an argument with his younger brother. This was pretty typical for Jared. It started after his brother ran into their shared bathroom, closed and locked the door just after hearing that Jared needed to use the bathroom. So Jared starts pounding on the door. He's yelling at his brother. And when his brother finally opened the door, Jared describes that he was all set to shove him, which was a common thing that Jared was doing with his brother. But just before he was about to raise his arms to push his brother, Jared remembered his special place from our previous guided imagery sessions. His special place was the beach. And in that moment with his brother, standing under the bathroom door threshold, 
Jared said he went to his beach. He could imagine himself at the beach and he described that his body got so relaxed in that moment that he lost the desire to push his brother. He took a deep breath and he walked away. He was so excited that he went to find his mom to tell her what happened. His mom um, later told me that she immediately wanted to send me a My Health Online message to describe what happened, but Jared begged her not to because he wanted to let me know himself. And he did at that next group session. He went on to tell our group that this was the first time in his life that he felt his body was able to calm down his brain so he could actually think. Yeah. Okay, another teen who came to my guided imagery group medical visits was Harper. I didn't know Harper or her family before her parents signed her up for sessions with me. She was 12 and all I knew is that she suffered from anxiety. Harper was really quiet at the beginning of our first session, which was okay. After that imagery exercise, when I invited kids to share their experience if they wanted to, Harper raised her Zoom hand and began to speak. And this is what she said to me in our group. <clears throat> when you described what we were going to be doing, I thought, oh boy, here we go again. My mom has been trying to get me to meditate or do breathing exercises with her since I was five years old. It never worked to help me feel less anxious. So I was thinking, as you were talking at the beginning of this visit, what a waste of my time and a waste of my mom's money. I hope at least our insurance is paying for most of this. It was. But when you began leading us on a walk on a secluded beach and asked us to look at the ocean, hear the waves, feel the warm sand under our feet, something strange happened. I got there. I was no longer in my bedroom on my laptop. Then when you asked us to enter the castle and look around, I took off and explored all the rooms. I found a library full of books I wanted to read. I picked one up, sat down on a windowsill bench and read. I felt so relaxed. I could see the ocean outside the window and there were healthy plants in the room I was in. I had no idea my body and brain knew how to get relaxed by themselves. So you guys, this whole session was 12 minutes and I led the group um, of kids through the castle maybe two and a half minutes at the most. I didn't describe rooms, certainly not a library, not books, not a windowsill bench facing the ocean and not healthy plants in the room. To be honest, um, I'm still in the process of processing <laughs> this experience um, for myself. What I've learned from Jared, from Harper, and more of my other patients is that once they've had the experience for themselves that their body and mind could work together to get calm and relaxed, they were more motivated, even empowered to try some other form of mindfulness on their own. So how can you ease your child into guided imagery? After this presentation, you'll have access to a list of resources, including recorded, online guided imagery exercises that can be experienced by a person on their own. Nature-based guided imagery is what we did in our exercise, but I love this study because it showed that a person's special place doesn't have to be in nature in order for them to feel relaxed and less anxious. Some of the kids I work with, they go to They've gone to Disneyland as their special place, um, or even, um, and this is true, a skateboard park. That would do the opposite for me, but that's just me. Um, so just like what happened for Jared and Harper, once a person experiences that their mind can get their body into balance, they may get more open to try another form of mindfulness, such as what you see here on this slide. 
My hope is that you all now have an understanding that guided imagery can be an effective mind-body tool that can help reduce chronic inflammatory symptoms, including what causes some of the suffering for kids with anxiety and ADHD. Guided imagery has been studied and shown to be effective for people of all ages, from toddlers to senior citizens. The script is tailored to a particular age group and condition. And then in addition to being an effective tool for mood and behavioral conditions, there's significant research showing it also to be an effective tool to improve athletic performance, both for amateur and elite athletes, for surgical patients to reduce pain, for people afflicted with cancer, for chronic fatigue, chronic abdominal pain, insomnia, migraines, and even to reduce test taking anxiety. The major contraindication would be if a person is suffering from a significant mental health crisis. Multiple benefits of using guided imagery as a tool for enhancing health exists. And benefits are not limited to to the participant of guided imagery but they can enhance dynamics for the entire family. Okay, so to summarize, a balanced nervous system is the goal. Neuroplasticity is how this happens. Resources are available. You'll get some, um, as um, Dr. Palanasami had let us know. And being open-minded and practicing gratitude is of great value. I'd like to leave you all now with some questions for self-reflection that you can contemplate on your own time. More questions. I wanna thank the Institute for Health and Healing. This team has been incredible um, that's allowed this presentation to be able to to occur. I'm extremely grateful for all of your time, energy and effort for, for making it to this presentation. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Janet, for a really wonderful uh, presentation. And also I was very relaxed during that uh, guided imagery. So I always appreciate attending these as well. So thank you for leading us all through that. So